revolution and like start a country, we just straight up killed it. All right. So how do we do that? We use El Garrote. Okay. El Garrote started off as a wee piece of rope. It got tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. <laughs> Broke his neck. Eventually, we got a little bit more elaborate. We got a steel collar. A steel collar would be pulled back, crushing his esophagus. But that wasn't going to kill him. So how do we make sure to kill him? We got a bolt. Put a bolt at the back. As the steel collar went back, the bolt would go forward and bear into his nerves and kill him slowly for sure. It could last a minute, but it basically lasts as long as the executioner wanted. The longest uh, instance of Garrote was 38 minutes. Lovely, right? Thanks, Luisa. Now you can't volunteer anymore because you're dead. Right, round of for Luisa. Holland. Not bad. Pope comes over and says, you're the man. You're the holy Roman Empire. Huh. Well done, man. You retire, uh, die of malaria, unfortunately. But no STDs! Round of applause! Yay! <laughs> Just to confuse you, Carlos I is also known as Carlos V, Carlos V, because he was the fifth Charles in the Habsburg European Empire, and he's only the first one here. Just in case you're wondering. Which you know you all are. Now, Carlos I was pretty good, but Felipe II was even better. Alright. So, Philip II moved the capital over to Madrid in. You're terrible, man. <laughs> 1561. Right, move the capital over here. You build the Escorial Monastery. You build the second version of the palace. We'll talk about the palace in a bit. You take over all of Spain, all of the Americas, all of Europe. Is that enough for you? Good about yourself. What country's here? Portugal. Portugal. So you have a huge, huge war with Portugal. You lose. Yeah, that's your so, well, it is. It is. Right now it is. <laughs> so you have a huge war with Portugal and thousands of people die. Terrible atrocity, and all for Portugal. Portugal's kind of crap, right? Just full of cod and pastries. Was it worth it? Yes, it was. What comes to Portugal? Comes three African nations. Comes a new trade route to India. Thank you very much, Vasco da Gama. Comes Brazil. Comes East Timor, which everyone forgets about. And a weak collection of islands in the Pacific Ocean called the Philippines. Oh! Takes over the Philippines, names them after himself. This dude's really, really religious, so he rocks over and he says, I'm gonna put an island on every, sorry, I'm gonna put a church on every single island in the Philippines. How many islands in the Philippines? 7,140. It's like, what? Okay, let's just do a few. <laughs> let's just do the main ones. But this is the confidence, that's the brazenness, that's the wealth of the Spanish Empire at this time. It's coming up to the end of the 16th century. By then, they had just plundered 1.5 trillion modern US dollars from the Americas, mainly in silver, a lot of gold and other commodities, but mainly silver, and of course destroyed hundreds of civilizations on the way. Not really good. So this pinnacle of Spanish society right here, guys, this Welsh man. <laughs> you retire, uh, become a priest for some reason, and die of an overdose of cookies. Cookies? Oh. <laughs> he just died natural colors. Right? <laughs> Round of applause for Philip II. No more applause, these guys suck. Right. <laughs> so we already met Philip III in Plata Mayor, all right, from the bird bones, if you remember correctly. That's I mentioned right. then he was my least favorite Habsburg, and basically he was really lazy. I'm talking really lazy. So lazy he got nicknamed Philip the Lazy. How lazy was he? Is this making sense? Is this adding up? <laughs> <laughs> he has one servant to put on his boot, a different servant to shine it, and a different servant to tie the laces. Wow. He had two boots. He had six servants for his boots alone. <laughs> We're not even past the shins at this stage, lads. All right? You have, and it's everyone's appointed job to just do that one job. You're not allowed to do the other job. All right? So you have one servant to open up your bed, one servant to put hot coals under the bed to heat it up, one servant to tuck you in, and a different servant to take those hot coals out. However, that last servant wasn't there one night. And it was everyone's job to just do that one job. So once the bed is in flames, everyone's like, I'm the tucking in guy, it's not my job to take the hot coals out, and you die in the bed of flames. Aww. <laughs> but you did kick out the Moors in 1607, that was a bit of a dick move. Small round of applause, guys. It's very small. <laughs> now, Philip IV. Philip gets a bad rap. Philip IV gets a bad rap. Why does he get a bad rap? He's basically just a crap king. Okay. You uh, start an 80-year war with Holland, which lasts 400 years. We're technically still at war with Holland. We call it a truce after 80 years, a 12-year truce, and then we're like, we'll keep on fighting mañana. And then we did it. So we're just no one wrote that last page in Esa Guerra Se Terminada. So you lose Holland, losing Holland, losing lose the rest of Northern Europe, you lose Portugal, and that's a big one. 
I guess Portugal's like the rest of the world. Um, so that's kind of crap. You feel so bad about this. You have so many losses in real life. You have fake battles against your friends in Parque de Retiro that you always win. Which is the saddest thing I've ever heard of the king to do. That's why his nickname makes a lot of sense. Loser. Philip the loser. <gasps> All right. But you're a cool dude. I do believe you're a cool dude. You're a purveyor of the arts. You believe the arts are the way forward. You're our personal patron to the lap. I'm basically starting Siglo de Oro, the golden majestic age of Spanish art and literature. So we're very indebted to you for that. Right? <laughs> now, Carlos II. Have you heard of Carlos II? <laughs> Why is Carlos Segundo screwed? Why is he Carlos the Damned, Carlos the Bewitched, Carlos the Cursed, Carlos the Generally Messed Up? What have we just had here? We have had 200 years of cousins marrying each other. Yeah. Alright, the Habsburgs never read Mendelssohn. They never realized that you got to spread that seed. They were just like, oh, you're the king there and you're the king there. If we get married, then our strength and our empire will be stronger, 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 and our kids won't be able to spell. Uh -huh. Alright, this went on for 200 years, leaving this, I'm so sorry, monstrosity. <laughs> so Carlos Segundo looks like a spoon. He's physically disabled and he's mentally retarded. He's so thick, his parents won't let him go to school because they're just like, no way, poor Carlito's gonna keep up. Alright? Uh, he's got the big Habsburg jaw. If you've seen any portraits of the Habsburg, they got this big jaw. Within that jaw, you've got a gargantuan tongue. Okay, it's from him that we get the false myth that everyone in Spain speaks with the lips because he couldn't speak properly. He also couldn't chew properly. <laughs> what happens when kings can't chew? Somebody chews for him. Somebody else chews for them. Oh my god! So you've got a 17th century servant masticating all those nasty 17th century meats and feeding him like a little bird. Oh! Lovely. How do we cure all these terrible afflictions? With the finest medicine available to us. And we just kicked out all our Jews. <laughs> The guys who could read. <laughs> so we're left with the really crappy Christian doctors. We all seen The Simpsons, you know, Dr. Nick? Yeah. It's like, wrist phone connected to my wrist watch. <laughs> that sort of stuff. So they rock up to the king, they're like, uh. <laughs> All right, we get a dead bird, still warm. Put it on his head. <laughs> Let it sit there overnight, because you know, science. <laughs> Funnily enough, that's not working. So we do the logical thing and get a bigger bird. And a bigger bird, and a bigger bird. Birds seem to be the issue. So we get a small cat, put it on his head. A small dog, put it on his head. A small goat, put it on his head. Uh, is this working? No. Is his health getting better? No. no. Has he provided us with an heir? Who gets to blame for this? Sorry. Someone said the goat. <laughs> Which is the funniest thing anyone has ever said on these tours. <laughs> but it wasn't the goat, it wasn't the doctors, it wasn't even him. It was a perfectly healthy, not inbred, 21-year-old fertile wife. So she feels terrible for not being able to provide him with an heir. So what did she do? You're on your deathbed. This is October 1700. She goes, Ah! Oh, I'm pregnant! Yay! You can die happy in the knowledge knowing that you've given the world another Habsburg and your lineage can go on and you do. You pass away on the 31st of October 7th. Guys, I was really mean to him. Big round of applause for Carlos. Yay. So so she runs oh she runs to a chamber in a depression. Okay, so how long did she stay in her chamber? Nine months? A year. I know I said they were bad doctors, but they can figure that much out. So after a year, they're kind of just like, do you have a baby in there? <laughs> you should have a three month old baby in there, according to our real office. So she said, a what? A baby, dude, we need an heir, come on, what's the crap? Like, oh, I just kind of said that to make him feel better. <laughs> Please don't kill me. <laughs> they didn't kill her because that was to start a huge civil war within the Habsburg uh, Empire, but she was kicked out of Spain. She was kicked out of Spain in 1700. It's really anticlimactic, the really miserable ending to the Habsburg Empire, guys. The strongest, most powerful, most influential empire in the whole, whole, whole world. In all of history, the first time that the phrase was used, an empire in which the sun never sets was for Philip II. So it went all around the world. Right? And then they lost it all. So what's the lesson we take away from this? Marry other Don't people. Marry <laughs> Don't marry your cousins. Yeah. Okay. I feel like I should have, shouldn't have to say that in 2017, but there's a lot of different cultures here. Don't exactly know what they get up to in Canada these days. Oh. Sorry, I was already too mean to both of you. So I'm sorry. Uh, so what happens then? 14-year war of Spanish secession, which lasts 
manana. Yeah. 14 years. Oh, really? <laughs> this one was actually Europe were on the ball. So it was basically a huge European scramble for the Spanish throne. Everyone fighting away to get the Spanish throne. Who wins? Le Français. French win, but their royal family aren't allowed to take over because then they'd have a, a global monopoly. So they send in their wee cousins, the Bourbons. And it's the Bourbons who we still have today. Right? Let's talk about them a little bit closer to the palace, which they built. End 1626. And it'll end. It's very ambitious of you, sir. What do you think this is, France? <laughs> to try my born year. 1992. Oh, so 375 years later, ladies and gentlemen. Ultimate manana unlocked. Now, in fairness to them, it's a pretty cool structure. It's none of this empty space or double door excuse that we can make with the other two. This is actually pretty cool. We've got three main aspects to it. We've got the main room in the middle, uh, and that's free to go in. If you want to check it out after the tour, you can. Uh, then you've got the crypts at the bottom and the bloods, I mean the watchtower at the top. <laughs> and you have to pay a fee to go to those. Um, uh, the watchtower used to have the best views in all of Madrid back in 1992. But since then the city has expanded and developed and there's some better views across the city. A lot of which are free to go to or if you are paying you're not giving money to the church. All right? So if you need some tricks and tips to get to those, give me a shout later and I'll point you the right direction. <coughs> Excuse me. It has had one main gig since its conception in 1992, and that has been the marriage of our current king, Felipe el Sexto, and his wife Leticia. Very, very, very controversial marriage. Why? Leticia had been divorced, <gasps> like some sort of oh. human. Oh my God! Madness, Dios right? Mio. So she had been divorced. Uh, she had been divorced. Uh, she was a journalist. She still is a journalist, and she was a student again, still a student. And she was an anti-monarch. She was very, very, very vocal on her feelings of the crown in all her writings. That is how smooth a talker Philip is. <laughs> uh, when it comes to the whole my place or yours thing, his job was pretty easy. You can't see her trumping that. Right? Even though he doesn't live there, he lives in a much more humble palace called Palacio de la Tartuela, which is really hard to pronounce after a few things in Milano. And that's halfway between here and El Escorial Monastery. Right? So on that day, people spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of euros. Hundreds of euros to what? To stand here. For we tickets to stand in this public property. Hundreds and hundreds, coming up to the thousands. Why? To see the beautiful bride walk all the way from the palace. 250 meters to the cathedral. What happened that day? Rained. Rained. Oh my so gosh. So people spent hundreds of years to see a beautiful white umbrella go into a limousine. Limousine drive 250 meters and another white umbrella walk into the cathedral. <laughs> Did they get their money back? No. Of course not. Welcome to Spain. All right. So guys, between the cathedral and the palace, do you see a city? Sort of, yeah. Not really, is there a correct answer for oh, this okay. anecdote? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you see the countryside. You see Casa de Campo. Casa de Campo is Madrid's nature reserve. All right. So while we had Parque de Retiro uh, over in the east of the city, that wasn't enough for the kings. The kings wanted to feign the countryside. They wanted a place to go hunting, wanted a place to just chill out and get away from city life. So they didn't build anything there. This Casa de Campo is 1,700 hecta hecta uh, hect acres. It is five times the size of Central Park in New York otherwise known as huge, all right? But obviously the main difference between Casa de Campo and Central Park is that Casa de Campo is just nature. It's not kept, it's not a manicured or anything like that. There's three metro stations in Casa de Campo alone. There's Lago, which is by a wee lake, nice way to spend an afternoon. There is Batan, Batan is useless, don't stop there. And then there's Casa de Campo itself. Casa de Campo itself has a, an aquarium, a zoo, and a theme park. So if that's what you're into, that's where it's at. Casa de Campo is also where I go jogging. You don't need to know that, but a little insight into my life. <laughs> I think I woke up with these calves. <laughs> right, guys, let's go over there so we can check out the palace and you can check out 